This guy, Michael Schofield, tattoos the entire layout of a prison on his body. It's bizarre. After careful planning, he decides to attempt a bank robbery one day. Armed with a gun, he pressures the manager to open the vault. But here's the twist. When the cops surround the place, instead of making a run for it, he gives up. Michael gets a five-year sentence for committing the crime with a deadly weapon. Now, he asks to be in a prison close to home. So off he goes to Fox River State Penitentiary, a level one facility. His lawyer and friend, Veronica, can't quite wrap their heads around why he's suddenly going for a heist or why he insists on a level one prison. Anyhow, Michael arrives at Fox River, and the head guard, Brad Bellick, seems to dislike Michael the moment he steps into the facility. The prison is so dangerous that the inmates kill each other without even thinking about the consequences. This happens especially among those serving life sentences, as they don't fear additional charges. Their situation can't really worsen. Michael shares a cell with Sucre, who's got about 16 months left before his release. Sucre gives Michael a prison tour, filling him in on the inmate scene. Gangs have claimed different parts of the yard, and vigilant correction officers in the towers keep tabs to prevent escapes or trouble. While observing, Michael notices an inmate across the prison. Sucre identifies him as Lincoln Burroughs, due to be executed in a month for killing the vice president's brother. Intrigued, Sucre questions Michael's interest in Lincoln, and Michael drops the bomb. Lincoln is his brother. A few months back, Michael had a heart-to-heart -heart with Lincoln about the murder accusations. Despite the evidence stacked against him, Lincoln swore to Michael that he was innocent of the crime. In the present, Michael decides to approach John Abruzzi, the mafia's big shot in charge of the prison industry operations. Inmates who cooperate can earn some money, and Abruzzi is the boss overseeing it all. Michael expresses his interest in joining the prison industry, but Abruzzi turns him down. As Michael walks away, he leaves an origami crane on the table. He cryptically hints to Abruzzi that he has more to offer than Abruzzi might realize soon. Later, an officer informs Michael that Warden Henry Pope wants to see him. Sucre is a bit concerned because getting an audience with the warden is usually reserved for serious matters. Michael meets with Warden Pope, who is aware of Michael's background as a structural engineer with an impressive academic record. Surprisingly, the warden reveals he needs Michael's help constructing a Taj Mahal model made of toothpicks for his wife. Although the warden has made some progress, he believes Michael's expertise can enhance the project. Despite having the opportunity to stay off the prison yard for three days a week, Michael declines to assist the warden with his personal project. On the other hand, Abruzzi gets intel from his right-hand man, Maggio, about an envelope containing a photo of Otto Fibonacci. Fibonacci, a mob informant, had testified against Abruzzi in Chicago, and witness protection had kept him out of Abruzzi's reach. Maggio informs Abruzzi that, along with the photo, he discovered an origami bird in the envelope. The revelation strikes Abruzzi. Michael, who had given him an origami bird earlier, must be the mysterious sender and knows about Fibonacci's whereabouts. Meanwhile, Michael is engaged in conversation with Charles Westmoreland, the man everyone believes to be D.B. Cooper. D.B. Cooper supposedly parachuted out of a plane 30 years ago with a cool million and a half in cash. While Michael and Westmoreland are deep in talk, Abruzzi confronts Michael about Fibonacci's location. When Michael refuses to spill the beans, a brawl breaks out between them. The correction officers intervene by firing shots into the ground, putting an end to the scuffle. Michael is summoned by Warden Pope, who tells him that he will be kept in solitary confinement for 90 days for his behavior. Seizing an opportunity, Michael strikes a deal with the warden. He agrees to help with the Taj Mahal model in exchange for avoiding solitary confinement. During his daily insulin visits to the medical wing, Michael receives shots from Dr. Sarah, the governor's daughter working at the facility. However, it's revealed that Michael is pretending to be diabetic. He made the scheme to access the infirmary regularly for a crucial element in his prison escape. As reports suggest Michael may not actually need insulin, Sarah decides to run tests on him. To validate his diabetic cover, Michael seeks out Benjamin C-Note, the local pharmacy guy in the prison. Michael requests PUGNAC from him, a substance that will help maintain a high blood sugar level making it seem like he's both diabetic and resistant to insulin. C-Note agrees to the deal, taking the money and assuring Michael that he'll get the requested drug. Later, Michael secures his prison industry card, 
granting him access to the PI where his brother Lincoln also works. Michael confides in Lincoln, sharing his plan to free him from prison before his impending execution. A successful escape requires both money and an external accomplice to disappear. Michael has meticulously planned it all out. Abruzzi, the owner of a plane, will aid in their disappearance, and the money supposedly possessed by Charles Westmoreland will ensure their survival. Though not yet on board with the plan, Michael is confident he can persuade them to join the escape. When asked about the prison blueprints, Michael surprises Lincoln by removing his shirt, revealing a detailed map of the entire prison tattooed on his body. Later that day, the prison guards conduct a shakedown, a surprise raid on prison cells to uncover weapons and contraband. Aware that he possesses a shank, Sucre hastily instructs Michael to discreetly remove it from under the table. Unfortunately, Bellick spots Michael with the shank and reports it to Warden Pope. Pope quickly realizes that the shank belongs to Sucre and not Michael. As a consequence, Sucre is sent to solitary confinement. When Bellick tries to search the cell again, Warden Pope intervenes, instructing Bellick not to search the cell any further. Pope knows he still needs Michael's assistance, which won't be possible if Michael is in solitary confinement. Moving on to the next phase of his plan, Michael aims to acquire a screw from within the prison. Armed with prior research, he heads to the yard confident that he'll find a screw beneath the bleachers. Armed with a coin, he attempts to unscrew it. However, the bleachers happen to belong to T-Bag's gang. T-Bag is a dangerous man with a dark history of kidnapping, assault, and murder of half a dozen girls and boys in Alabama. He approaches Michael, expressing his interest in making Michael his boyfriend. Unfazed, Michael refuses and continues removing the screw. T-Bag becomes furious, ordering Michael to leave and sternly warning him to stay away from the bleachers. The following day, Michael makes another attempt to obtain the screw, but T-Bag and his boyfriend catch him in the act. Cornered and with no alternative, Michael is forced to give the screw to the gang. During a break, he decides to find it in T-Bag's cell. Unfortunately, T-Bag catches him in the act. In a quick improvisation, Michael claims he wants to join their gang. From above, C-Note, who's been tasked with arranging PUGNEC, observes Michael with T-Bag. T-Bag informs Michael that they plan to confront the black inmates that night, and if Michael desires to join, he must prove his loyalty by fighting alongside them. Seeing Michael associating with T-Bag, C-Note assumes Michael is conspiring with him and has chosen to be part of his gang. Consequently, he refuses to provide Michael with the desired drug. Despite Michael's attempts to explain that he is using T-Bag to gain something, C-Note remains unconvinced. As the night unfolds, a brawl breaks out between the white and black inmates. Spotting T-Bag's boyfriend, May Tag, holding the screw, Michael intercepts him, successfully grabbing the screw. C-Note observes Michael in a scuffle with May Tag, fighting to obtain the screw he requires. Amidst the chaos, a black inmate stabs May Tag multiple times in the chest before fleeing the scene. When T-Bag witnesses May Tag collapsing onto Michael, he wrongly assumes Michael is responsible for the attack. This misunderstanding fuels T-Bag's desire for revenge for the death of his boyfriend. The corrections officers quickly take charge, making all the inmates return to their cells. This leaves Michael stunned. He's never witnessed a killing, let alone committed one. The next day, C-Note approaches Michael, offering him PUGNAC after seeing his scuffle with May Tag over a screw. Michael takes the pills and heads to the medical wing, where Sarah conducts a diabetes test. Thanks to PUGNAC, the test indicates a high sugar level, falsely portraying him as diabetic. Later, Abruzzi and his gang corner Michael in a storage shed, pressing him for details about Fibonacci. Despite the pressure, Michael refuses to spill the beans until they're outside prison walls. In response, Abruzzi and his fellow inmates from the PI group resort to a gruesome tactic, cutting off Michael's two smallest toes on his left foot in an attempt to extract the information through torture. However, their brutal method proves unsuccessful. After Michael is brought to the infirmary, Sarah suggests to Bellick that an investigation should be conducted. As Bellick is on Abruzzi's side, Bellick dismisses the need for an inquiry claiming that Michael stepped on a gardening tool. Afterward, Michael informs Lincoln of his need for Sucre's help in creating an escape route by digging into their cell. However, Lincoln cautions Michael against trusting Sucre, labeling him a thief and emphasizing the risk of sharing such plans. To test Sucre's reliability, Michael discreetly places a phone in a compartment, instructing him to keep it a secret. Lincoln then tips off Bellick, 
falsely claiming that Sucre possesses the phone. Sucre successfully passes the test by not revealing the fake phone to Bellic, but as a consequence, he loses his conjugal visit rights. Later, when Sucre discovers that the phone is just a soap, not real, he becomes infuriated with Michael and blames him for losing his conjugal time. Upon learning about the prison break plan, Sucre becomes even more infuriated. He opposes the idea, expressing his desire to serve the remaining 16 months of his sentence and later start a peaceful life with his fiancée, Mary Cruz. Frustrated with the plan, Sucre requests a cell transfer to avoid getting caught in the breakout attempt. As a result of Sucre's transfer, Michael gets a new cellmate, Haywire who has been moved from the psych ward to join him in his cell. Meanwhile, Philly Falzone holds a meeting with John Abruzzi, aiming to extract Fibonacci's whereabouts. Falzone, now the head of the Abruzzi Mafia family following Abruzzi's imprisonment, is anxious about potential consequences if Fibonacci testifies against him. Recognizing the danger, Abruzzi opts for an alternative approach. He engages Teabag, pointing out their common enemy. However, their attempt to confront Michael takes an unexpected turn, as Abruzzi ends up assaulting Teabag to reconcile with Michael. When asked about his demands, Michael proposes a deal. He will reveal Fibonacci's location in exchange for a plane. Now informed about the impending prison break, Abruzzi agrees to cooperate, but on the condition that Michael discloses Fibonacci's whereabouts within a month, preventing the latter from testifying. Later, as Michael plans to dig in his cell while his cellmate sleeps, he encounters a challenge. Haywire, his new cellmate, has a medical condition preventing him from sleeping. Meanwhile, in the cell, Michael inquires of his new cellmate whether he ever contemplates escaping. Haywire deems it a bad idea and recommends reporting any escape plans to Officer Bellick. As the conversation progresses, Haywire becomes curious about Michael's tattoos, requesting to see the entire tattoo. However, Michael declines. Shortly after, a doctor, accompanied by an officer, arrives to administer pills to Haywire. Once the pair departs, Haywire deliberately vomits out the pills, claiming that the doctor wants to dull his senses. Since laying eyes on Michael's tattoos, Haywire becomes fixated on them. With a Bruzy's assistance, Michael acquires drain line root control chemical. Subsequently, he heads to the toxic control center, searching for a masonry cleaner bottle. Once he secures both chemicals, Michael empties toothpaste tubes, filling them with the acquired substances. During a visit to the infirmary, as Sarah steps out momentarily, Michael seizes the chance to release both chemicals into the ventilation system. The ensuing chemical reaction induces corrosion in the metal. Meanwhile, Mary Cruz shares the news of her pregnancy with Sucre, expressing her concern about raising the child alone. Sucre reassures her, promising he will be out in 16 months to care for their family. However, the following day, Sucre's friend, Hector, holds a meeting with him and confesses that he and Mary Cruz are now a couple. It turns out Mary Cruz, overwhelmed by the responsibility of being a single parent, accepted Hector's offer of support. This revelation infuriates Sucre, as he is unable to bear the betrayal of his own friend, who has not only taken his fiancée but also his unborn child. As Sucre witnesses his life falling apart before his eyes, he decides to rejoin the escape plan. Upon learning about Sucre's decision, Michael is relieved to have him back on board. However, to proceed, they must find a way to deal with Haywire. Meanwhile, Haywire's fixation on Michael's tattoos intensifies, with him even suggesting that it resembles a pathway. Initially dismissive, Michael becomes concerned when he catches Haywire drawing the tattoo pattern, realizing the need to act. Michael begins banging his head against the cell door, successfully attracting the attention of the prison guards. Upon seeing Michael's injury, Michael assumed that Haywire attacked him and promptly removed him from the cell. Sucre then rejoins Michael, catching up on the ongoing details of the escape plan. With enough grout removed from the bricks, Michael instructs Sucre to create noise so that he can break through the brick wall. Sucre promptly starts singing, provoking complaints from other inmates for the disturbance. Seizing the opportunity, Michael successfully breaks through the weakened bricks and crawls through the hole for the first time. Meanwhile, Special Agent Kellerman and Special Agent Hale are en route to the prison. They're working for someone who framed Lincoln and wants him dead. They suspect Michael's presence in the prison, so they obtain his transfer order. Initially, Pope hesitates due to his friendship with Michael and the latter's assistance in building the Taj Mahal model. However, Kellerman leverages a threat to expose Pope's illegitimate son, a consequence of an affair during his vacation in Toledo. Even though the son, unfortunately, succumbed to addiction, 
Pope struggled with the idea of disclosing everything to his wife. Faced with blackmail, Pope reluctantly agrees to transfer Michael to another facility. Upon learning about the impending transfer, Michael confides in Pope about his desire to stay. He reveals that Lincoln is his brother, and he wants to be by his side until the execution. Despite Pope's willingness to honor Michael's wish, he's powerless against the influential figures pursuing Michael. Consequently, Michael is informed of his impending transfer scheduled for the next day. To find a way to block the transfer, he seeks advice from Charles Westmoreland, who suggests several options. Michael decides to pursue a transfer block, which typically takes a month to process, giving him the time needed to escape Fox River. Following Westmoreland's guidance, Michael drafts a transfer block letter to Pope, claiming he suffers from sinusitis. Meanwhile, he diligently works on his escape plan. Sucre hangs sheets to conceal their secret hole and uses a mirror to keep an eye out for approaching guards. Using his tattoos as a guide, Michael navigates the crawlspace and successfully reaches the roof. As the cell check starts, an alert officer discovers Michael's absence, prompting an alarm. Michael observes the police vehicles closely and notes three potential routes. English and Percy Roads are bustling with police activity, while Fitz Street remains deserted. It leads Michael to conclude that the escape must occur via Fitz Road. Upon learning of Michael's escape, Pope initially checks his office, only to find Michael there diligently working on the Taj Mahal model. Although Bellic remains suspicious of Michael's sudden disappearance, Pope dismisses him. He states that Michael won't be their concern anymore since he is scheduled for transfer the next day. It turns out that Kellerman and Hale had visited Pope at his house and threatened him to follow their orders, or they would reveal everything to his wife. Fearing getting exposed, Pope tore up Michael's transfer request and decided to proceed with the transfer. The next day, Michael is brought outside for the scheduled transfer. However, just as the transfer is about to proceed, Pope intervenes, claiming that Michael has a medical condition and can't be sent. This surprising move suggests that Pope genuinely cares for the inmates and is willing to risk exposing himself to his wife. Before Kellerman and Hale can execute their threat, Pope chooses to disclose the truth to his wife. As it turns out, his wife is already aware of the situation and forgives him for his actions. Michael understands that he needs to dedicate a significant amount of time to finishing the excavation inside the walls. He keeps having to return to his cell to make count, which is making this challenging. Discussing this hurdle with Sucre, he learns that the only time count doesn't occur is during a lockdown. Capitalizing on his access to the crawlspace, Michael takes the drastic step of turning off the air conditioning. The resulting heat discomforts the prisoners, prompting Teabag to start a fight with a guard, leading to a lockdown. As the prisoners express their frustration, the situation escalates, and they breach the prison cell control room. Teabag seizes the opportunity to open all the cells. To his luck, a set of keys grants him and the rioters unrestricted access to the entire prison. Seizing the opportunity, Michael and Sucre quietly enter the crawlspace, where Michael unveils his plan. He uses a light source and covers it with a page with the devil's drawing. Using an egg beater, they will drill holes strategically, compromising the wall's load-carrying capacity. It will weaken the wall, and it will be easy for them to break through it. Once successful, they plan to access a drainage pipe connected to the prison's sewage system. Progressing through the pipe will grant them entry to the infirmary, a crucial step in their escape route. As news of the riot reaches the infirmary, Chaos ensues among the prisoners there as well. Amid the turmoil, one of the inmates attempts to assault Dr. Sarah. In self-defense, she injects him in the arm, creating a momentary diversion that allows her to lock herself in her office. Other prisoners gather outside Sarah's office, intending to take advantage of the situation and harm her. The situation escalates until authorities arrive to regain control. The governor, who is also Sarah's father, contacts Pope Henry to ensure his daughter's safety. Unaware of Sarah's dire situation, Pope reassures the governor that the infirmary, located in B Wing, remains unaffected by the events in a wing. Little does he know that Sarah is fighting for her life amid the chaos in the infirmary. Amid the chaos, Teabag seizes Officer Bob as a hostage. While torturing the officer, he inadvertently stumbles into Michael's cell and discovers the escape route. Before he can divulge this information to everyone, Abruzzi intervenes. When Michael returns to the cell, he realizes that both Teabag and Officer Bob are aware of the escape route. As for Officer Bob, Michael decides not to cause him harm. In exchange for his safety, Bob promises not to reveal anything about the escape hole to anyone. Later, as Michael enters the control room, 
he spots Dr. Sarah on the CCTV struggling in the infirmary. Acting swiftly, he arrives just in time, crawling through the crawlspace before the prisoners can gain access to the room. Michael pulls Sarah into the crawlspace, and she questions how he knew the layout. Michael explains that he participated in a prison industry project focused on removing mold from the area. This story gives him a reasonable explanation, and he manages to deflect further suspicion. The two manage to exit the crawlspace, and a brief moment between Michael and Sarah suggests underlying romantic feelings. However, their connection is abruptly interrupted when the pursuing prisoners discover them. As a prisoner attempts to approach Sarah, Michael stands in his way, ready to protect her. Amid the brawl, Michael successfully subdues the big guy, while Sarah deals with the other by incapacitating him with a knee strike. As the authorities regain control, snipers are positioned to intervene. Upon spotting Michael with Sarah, they perceive him as a threat and aim at him. In a selfless act, Sarah positions herself in front of Michael to shield him from the potential danger. When the prisoners catch up to them, Sarah seizes an opportunity to escape, and Michael ducks causing the sniper to inadvertently target the other inmates behind them. On the other front, Sucre and Abruzzi successfully drill the holes, enabling them to breach the wall easily. Simultaneously, the governor arrives and is relieved to find his daughter unharmed. The authorities are working diligently to restore order. Teabag suggests killing Officer Bob to prevent him from revealing the escape route, but Michael opposes the idea. As the situation intensifies with the arrival of law enforcement, Michael decides to release Bob. Unfortunately, before Bob can exit, Teabag intercepts him, inflicts a fatal stab wound, and heartlessly throws him off, resulting in his demise. Charles Westmoreland becomes a first-hand witness to this brutal act. Michael, Sucre, and Abruzzi begin to strategize on accessing the old sewer pipe leading to their exit point, the infirmary. Michael tells them they need to start at the storage building halfway across the yard. Their plan involves getting the prison industry's team inside to undertake some work, allowing them to chip through the floor and reach the pipe. However, their discussion is disrupted by Teabag, who feels left out. Despite the other's reluctance, he insists on being part of the escape and begins making threats. He warns that if they exclude him, he'll reveal their plan using his beautiful voice. Despite the pressure, Michael is not ready to entertain Teabag's demands at this point. To reach the storage room, the PI team pretends to have some work there. As they attempt to open the door, they're unexpectedly confronted by guards. It turns out the storage room has been converted into a break room exclusively for guards. No inmates are allowed except Charles, who has a spotless record spanning the last 30 years. The snag leads Michael to approach Charles and extend an invitation to join the escape plan. Charles, however, cautions Michael against relying on his wealth, clarifying that he is not D.B. Cooper. In response, Michael begins pointing out intricate details that suggest Charles is indeed D.B. Cooper. Nevertheless, Charles denies the claim, stating that during the plane hijacking, he was finishing up a 30-day drunk and disorderly. Now, the team must find a way to set the break room on fire so that Abruzzi can get them assigned to PI work there. Sucre proposes a plan involving putting rubber cement in the coffee machine, causing it to blow and catch fire. However, they need an inside man to execute the job. Later, Michael locates Charles's missing cat from a lockdown. Grateful for the reunion, Charles expresses his thanks to Michael. When Michael requests a favor in return, to set fire to the break room, Charles makes it clear that, despite the gratitude, he can't be part of the escape plan. Due to his good behavior in prison, Charles has developed a friendship with Bellick. Bellick reaches out to him to inquire about Bob's death, considering Charles's cell is right in front of the crime scene. Being Bob's friend, Bellick is determined to catch the murderer and believes Charles knows the culprit. Despite being aware of the murderer's identity, Charles is reluctant to disclose it. He fears the consequences as it could be seen as snitching, putting his own life at risk. In a shocking turn of events, Charles returns to his cell only to find his cat dead. It appears that Bellick, angered by Charles's silence, took revenge on him. Enraged by this act, Charles decides to retaliate by aiding Bellick's enemies, Michael and his team. He orchestrates a fire making it seem like the incident occurred due to Bellick's cigarette. In the meantime, Teabag's cellmate, Seth, confides in Bellick about the murderer's identity. It turns out that it's all part of Teabag's scheme. Teabag successfully frames his friend by placing a picture of Bob's daughter under his bed. The friend gets arrested, and Seth, rather than Teabag, is taken into custody. Seth wishes the blame had fallen on Teabag. It turns out that Teabag is sexually assaulting Seth 
who is tied up and reaches out to Michael for help. Despite Michael's attempt to intervene, Teabag warns him to stay out of his affairs. With no one hearing his pleas, Seth tragically decides to end his own life. This deeply shocks Michael, who feels responsible for Seth's fate. He believes that he could have done something to help him. As anticipated, the prison industry's PI team is summoned to restore the room. Teabag is now part of the team. Once Bellic departs, Sucre positions himself at the door to keep watch. The rest of the team begins demolishing the floor precisely where the drain is located, aiming to access the sewerage system. As they keep digging, they are left with plenty of concrete pieces. To dispose of them, they discreetly toss the fragments into the yard. This activity captures the attention of C-Note, who is compelled to ponder the source of these concrete pieces. As time passes, new inmates, including David, also known as Tweener, are admitted to the facility. Despite his attempts to fit in, neither the black nor white inmates want to associate with him. Seizing the opportunity, Teabag intimidates Tweener, suggesting he could become his new friend. Recognizing Teabag's ill intentions, Tweener stands up for himself, warning Teabag to stay away. Despite this, Tweener senses impending danger around him. Michael witnesses the situation and cautions Teabag to keep his distance from Tweener, but Teabag remains unfazed. The next day, when the prison industry's team goes to work, Michael confronts Teabag, hitting him with a hammer and issuing a final warning to stay away from Tweener or any other inmate. This time, Michael isn't afraid of Teabag exposing their escape plan. He knows that it's as crucial for Teabag as it is for the rest of the team. Thanks to Michael's firm warning, Teabag backs down. On the other hand, a Abruzzi's associate, Falzone, has stopped bribing Bellic. Upon learning this, Abruzzi assures Bellic that he'll secure the funds. However, Bellic has now realized that all the money is under Falzone's control, making Abruzzi useless. Simultaneously, Falzone has also distanced himself from Abruzzi, appointing Gus Fiorello to gather information about Fibonacci's whereabouts. As a result, Abruzzi loses control of the prison industries, and Gus Fiorello takes charge. The new PI team didn't find the hole that is now concealed cleverly with cardboard. With no option left, Michael is compelled to disclose Fibonacci's whereabouts to Falzone to regain access to the storage room. However, he sets a condition. He'll reveal the information only if Falzone agrees to give him $200 million. It is at this point that Abruzzi reveals that Lincoln's attorney, Veronica, is under their surveillance. If Michael refuses to comply, her safety will be in jeopardy. Left with no choice, Michael discloses the information about Fibonacci's whereabouts. To eliminate Fibonacci, Falzone and his men head to the provided location. However, it turns out to be a trap as the police intercept them on the spot charging them with international gun charges and parole violations. Michael orchestrated this plan with the help of an ally, Mika, with whom he had previously discussed the strategy before entering the prison. A single phone call from Mika was instrumental in getting the job done. Abruzzi is delighted by Falzone's capture, as Falzone had been making threats. With Bellic's bribe settled, Abruzzi regains control as the head of the prison industry's workers. The team resumes their work, digging the hole, unaware of another problem heading their way, see note. He informs Bellic that Abruzzi requires a new worker for the PI. When Abruzzi declines, C-Note takes a bold step, standing on the board covering the hole. It becomes evident that he knows the truth about their escape plan and wants to be a part of it. Just like that, another team member is added to the escape plan. Later, a prison guard informs Michael that his wife has come to see him. It turns out to be Nika whom he married two days before the robbery as part of their plan. During their private time together, Mika hands over a credit card to Michael like he asked. Once done, she departs, and Sarah catches a glimpse of the couple sharing a kiss. It appears she is hurt to discover that Michael is already married. On the other hand, Bellic senses familiarity upon seeing Mika but struggles to recall where he has encountered her before. Meanwhile, Michael rips off the front and back of the credit card, exposing it as a key card. Flashbacks reveal Michael's efforts to access the prison security system manual and an encoder. Armed with this information, he encoded the card with the master key code to the prison personal items storeroom. Sneaking off at night, he uses the card to enter the room and retrieve his belongings, which had been seized upon his arrival. Among them is a recorder, but his gold watch is missing. The next day, Michael inquires with Charles about the theft of inmates' belongings. Charles confirms that it happens all the time. 
With Officer Deary earning a notorious reputation as the worst thief, Michael identifies his missing watch on Geary's wrist and enlists Tweener to steal it in exchange for a favor at the prison industries. To secure the job at PI, Tweener pretends to have a seizure. When the Geary is around him, he seizes the opportunity and snatches the watch from the officer's wrist. On the other hand, Westmoreland gets heartbreaking news from Pope Henry, his daughter is battling last-stage esophageal cancer, and she has just a few weeks left. The Department of Corrections has refused to release Westmoreland, fearing he might try to escape again. They only grant furlough extensions for funerals. The harsh reality hits Westmoreland hard. He can only see his dying daughter after she's gone. Determined to be with her in her final moments, he decides to be part of the escape plan. When Westmoreland shares his plan with Michael, Michael gets skeptical. He emphasizes that every member of the escape team must contribute something valuable. In response, Westmoreland offers his wealth and confesses to being D.B. Cooper, the infamous plane hijacker who escaped with $1.5 million. To convince Michael, he hands over a distinctive $100 bill bearing the same serial number as the hijacked money. When Michael gets his watch back, he cleverly attaches it to his tape recorder and conceals the device in the grass just outside the infirmary. His objective is to capture the prison guards' movements by recording the exact timing of their rounds near the infirmary. The next day, Sarah engages Michael in conversation, inquiring about his marital status. Though Michael remarks that his marriage doesn't fit the conventional definition of the word, Sarah sets the boundaries, declaring that their relationship will be strictly limited to doctor-patient interactions. Later on, Michael and Sucre listen to the playback from the tape recorder Michael had concealed. The device captures the jingling sound of the guard's keys. Analyzing the recording, Michael discovers that the guards take 18 minutes to complete their rounds. This crucial information means they have a window of 18 minutes to execute their plan and scale the prison wall. Later, Michael does some maths and informs Lincoln that they have a mere 18-minute window to successfully surmount the prison wall. Breaking down the logistics, he notes that removing the bars from the infirmary windows will take 5 minutes. This leaves them with a tight time frame of 13 minutes for the entire team to traverse the wire and clear the wall. Adding another layer of complexity, each member requires 2 minutes to make the crossing. Doing the math, it becomes apparent that only 6 people can make it in time. Here lies the problem. The escape team comprises 7 members. Someone has to be excluded from the plan to ensure its success. C-Note eavesdrops on their conversation and promptly shares the scoop with the entire team. Everybody thinks that T-Bag should be the one to leave the team. However, as it unfolds, T-Bag has already taken precautions. He's reached out to his cousin, briefing him on the plan. If the cousin doesn't hear from T-Bag five minutes before and 20 minutes after the escape, he will spill the beans to the warden. Meanwhile, Bellic diligently racks his brain to recall where he's encountered Nika before. After seeing her photo, he realizes she was at a strip club. Determined, Bellic tracks her down and confronts her, pressing details about what Michael demanded in exchange for a green card. Initially hesitant, Nika spills the beans under threat, admitting she handed Michael a credit card. Amid it all, Bellic tells Michael about Nika mentioning the credit card. However, his search in Michael's cell comes up empty. Bellic, not holding back, continues badmouthing Michael's stripper wife until Sarah puts a stop to it. Later, when Michael attempts to explain to Sarah that he only married Nika for her green card, it becomes apparent that Sarah has lost interest in his words. Simultaneously, C-Note makes Sucre grasp the reality of their roles in the escape plan. Everyone brings something valuable to the table except for them. C-Note fears the others might easily kick them out of the team. It makes him consider carrying out the plan independently. Meanwhile, T-Bag tries persuading Westmoreland, now D.B. Cooper, to step away from the plan, but D.B. Cooper warns him to steer clear. To get rid of T-Bag, Abruzzi reaches out to his mob contact, instructing him to abduct T-Bag's cousin, it will leave no one outside to snitch. Unfortunately, the execution took a dark turn. A Bruzzi's man reports back, admitting that the kidnapping went awry, resulting in the tragic deaths of the cousin and his five-year-old son. Shocked and burdened by guilt, Abruzzi grapples with the weight of his actions. Haunted by the incident, he finds himself dreaming of his son in a coffin. The weight of the lives he's taken and the crimes he's committed bears down on him. Seeking redemption, he turns to a priest, pouring out his remorse and praying for forgiveness. Upon learning about his cousin and nephew's demise from Pope Henry, T-Bag succumbs to his emotions. Having dealt with T-Bag's cousin, Abruzzi confronts him again but opts not to end his life. Instead, 
he warns Teabag to steer clear of the escape plan. In a tearful agreement, Teabag agrees. However, when Albruzzi turns around, Teabag slashes his throat with a razor blade, fueled by anger over his family's death. Meanwhile, the rest of the team explores the pipe beneath the hole they've dug. Their efforts are disrupted when C.O. Geary approaches to inspect the break room. With Michael still absent from the sewerage system, Lincoln has no choice but to block Geary's path. Tensions rise, leading to Lincoln throwing him a punch. In the aftermath of assaulting an officer, Lincoln is sent to solitary confinement for 90 days. When Michael emerges from the pipe, he's distressed to learn about Lincoln's predicament. Meanwhile, Abruzzi is rushed to the hospital outside the prison in critical condition. In the meantime, with Lincoln confined to solitary, the five remaining inmates gather to discuss their next move. Some suggest escaping within the next day or two, but Michael isn't ready. With only 36 hours left until Lincoln's execution, Michael is determined not to leave without him. Despite Sucre's persistent attempts to persuade him to join the escape plan, Michael reveals a different agenda. He pulls out a blade, slices his arm, and retrieves a black pill he had hidden before entering the prison. Afterward, he engages in prayer with the prison priest, handing him a crucifix necklace with a request to deliver it to Lincoln. Upon receiving the necklace, Lincoln discovers a hollow section containing the black pill and a note that says, Eat 810. Meanwhile, the rest of the team heads to the break room for their PI work. Michael strategically breaks a water pipe, causing the area to become wet. In response, Bellic barges in and orders the workers to dry the place, even if it means working through the entire night. This aligns perfectly with the team's plan, an undisturbed night for their mission. At precisely 8.10, Lincoln consumes the pill and abruptly collapses. Guards swiftly rush him to the infirmary. Simultaneously, the rest of the team crawls through the pipes, reaching the maintenance room directly beneath the infirmary. The metal has corroded successfully thanks to the chemicals Michael poured into the vent. However, as Michael prepares to ascend to Sarah's office, he's taken aback to find that the officers have replaced the corroded pipe with a sturdy 12-inch metal one. Both Michael and Lincoln attempt to remove the pipe using rods, but their efforts prove futile. Shocked and disheartened, Michael tells the team that there seems to be no alternative for their escape, provoking Teabag's anger. Meanwhile, Sarah returns to her office to discover Lincoln near the vent, having removed his four. When questioned, Lincoln explains that he felt nauseous and left the bed to avoid vomiting on the floor. Before the team can exit the maintenance room, a police officer enters and spots a rod on the floor. Everyone hides, but the officer fails to locate them and departs without further investigation. With the mission unsuccessful, the team leaves the maintenance room, their disappointment evident. Just as Bellick is finishing his shift, he notices the sheetrock outside the break room is still in place. Investigating, he attempts to open the door, but it's locked by the team inside. The rest of the team has returned to the break room, except for D.B. Cooper, who hasn't made it back in time. Bellick enters the room, questioning why the work isn't completed. The worker explains they couldn't clean the mold overnight. In response, Bellick insults them and orders the guard to escort them back to their cells. Suddenly realizing they are one member short, Bellick returns to the room only to find Westmoreland inside crouched down and tying his shoelaces. The team is promptly sent back to their cells. Sucre offers words of comfort to Michael, advising him not to worry as no matter what, Lincoln will appreciate his efforts. As the countdown to Lincoln's execution reaches 24 hours, media attention intensifies due to the impending execution of the killer of the vice president's brother. Left with no other option, Michael implores Sarah to speak to her father regarding Lincoln's case. Although Sarah is willing to help Michael, she reveals that she and her father are estranged, and he is unlikely to listen to her, regardless of the circumstances. On the flip side, Michael learns from D.B. Cooper that a decade ago, an electric chair failed to generate enough spark to execute an inmate, resulting in a three-week delay in resetting the entire process. This revelation captures Michael's attention, as he realizes that any malfunction in the electric chair could potentially grant Lincoln an additional three weeks. Tweener overhears Michael's remarks. Back in his cell, Michael grabs some food and uses it as bait to catch a rat. With the help of the rat, he successfully short-circuits the electric chair. Simultaneously, Bellick has already tasked Tweener with closely monitoring Michael. When Tweener discloses overhearing Michael discussing tampering with the chair, Bellick checks it and discovers it is malfunctioning. Upon inspecting the electric board, they find a rat there. The technician suggests filing a report about the technical issue but Bellick pressures him into simply changing the fuse and overlooking the problem. 
Later, Bellick visits Michael's cell to summon him for the final visitation with Lincoln. Meanwhile, Dr. Sarah pays a visit to her father, the governor, and pleads with him to review Lincoln's case. Despite the governor's resistance, Sarah hands him Lincoln's file and urges him to read the information at least once. In a bittersweet moment, Lincoln and Michael engage in a game of gin as Lincoln enjoys the blueberry pancakes he requested for his final meal. Soon, Veronica arrives, having exhausted all efforts to stop the execution. Despite appealing to the judge for Lincoln's release, her efforts prove futile. As Lincoln is escorted to the execution room, one of the officers notifies Pope Henry about a call from the governor. Briefly, there is a glimmer of hope that Lincoln's execution might be delayed. But it becomes apparent that the governor had called to confirm that the execution would proceed as scheduled. Lincoln is securely strapped to the chair, visible to Veronica and Michael through the glass window. Surprisingly, Lincoln notices an elderly man in the same room as Michael's, causing him a moment of shock. Abruptly, the curtains close, hinting at an unexpected development. A few minutes later, Pope Henry discloses to Michael and Veronica that the judge has ordered a two-week delay in the execution. Still processing the shock, Lincoln informs Michael that he saw their father in the room while strapped to the chair. It is revealed that someone secretly placed autopsy files in the judge's office, asserting that the body of Terence Stedman, whom Lincoln was accused of killing, belonged to someone else. In a last-minute delivery to the judge, two files were submitted, one containing an autopsy report indicating a healthy appendix for the deceased, and the other reporting that the same person had undergone an appendix removal surgery. With the two-week extension, Michael revises his escape plan, now involving the team to navigate through the psych ward. It turns out the psych ward shares the subsurface line with the infirmary, and that line connects the break room to the psych ward. However, a challenge arises. They can access the hole in the break room to reach a grate that gets them halfway there, but the other half needs to be covered above ground. Considering the three towers facing the grate area, everyone assumes it would look like a suicide attempt. In a later conversation with Sucre, Michael shares his need to explore the pipes beneath the psych ward to ensure a smooth passage. Sucre proposes a solution. With the assistance of Sucre's cousin, Monch, who works in the laundry department, they manage to obtain a guard uniform for Michael. This uniform will help him cover the remaining distance to the psych ward. As the PI team returns to the break room, a sheet of the wall starts leaking the concealed concrete dust. At that moment, Bellic enters the room, prompting C-Note to hastily cover the hole with his foot. When Bellic assigns a task to C-Note, D.B. Cooper cleverly pushes him aside and takes over, using his own leg to conceal the hole. Despite Cooper's efforts, the sheet eventually breaks, causing the concrete pieces to spill onto the floor. Simultaneously, officers stand just outside the break room, quizzing T. Bag with a general knowledge question. The team acts swiftly, dumping the concrete pieces into the hole. T. Bag manages to delay the officer for a short time, and as the officer proceeds to open the break room door, T. Bag provides the correct answer to his question. Hearing the response, the officer retreats, successfully sparing the team from exposure. That night, Michael crawls through the sewage pipe and emerges out from the other grate. The remaining distance he must cover is above ground, and thanks to the guard uniform, he navigates without arousing suspicions. The uniform proves valuable as it allows him entry into the psych ward under the guise of looking for a bathroom. Since blue officers rarely visit the psych ward, the attendant is unfamiliar with them and permits Michael to use the facilities. Seizing the opportunity, Michael heads to the basement, where he discovers another grate leading to the sewage system. On his way back to the cell, he is forced to hide due to an officer conducting a check in the maintenance area. While hiding, Michael unintentionally leans against a hot water pipe, resulting in a burn on a portion of his back. While Michael successfully avoids detection by the guard, he ends up with a burn on his back, and the uniform now bears a hole. Monch is furious, anticipating trouble. However, he skillfully handles the situation by claiming he accidentally burned the uniform while ironing. Although Michael's wound is treated, he chooses not to disclose the actual cause behind it. Now, the problem is that a portion of his tattoo has been burnt off. This section contained the map detailing his route from the psych ward to the infirmary. The pathway crucial for the success of the escape is now lost. In the break room later, an officer instructs the team to wrap up the work by tomorrow, explaining that professionals will take over tasks like carpeting. This means the team must conceal a hole before the new crew notices during carpet installation. With limited time, Michael comes up with a plan. Using plywood and a few inches of fast-setting concrete to make the hole disappear, they start working, 
but Belik disrupts their strategy. He's brought Tweener on board as an informant, hindering the team's actions in his presence. Quickly thinking, they send Tweener to clean the paintbrushes. As Tweener leaves, he attempts to eavesdrop on their conversation but fails to hear anything. Although the task involving the hole still needs to be completed, an officer shows up and instructs the team to finish quickly, as he needs their assistance in the yard. Without any alternative, the inmates must comply with the orders. Meanwhile, Sarah discovers a burnt fragment of a guard's uniform in Michael's burn. Growing suspicious, she reports it to the Pope. Pope Henry summons Michael and queries him about the discovery. When Michael declines to answer, he is sent to solitary confinement, where Lincoln is also being held. Meanwhile, the rest of the team is anxious about the unresolved hole in the break room. They collectively decide that Sucre should use the opening behind the toilet to reach the break room and patch up the hole. When Sucre expresses worries about getting back out, they suggest that he can re-enter the sewerage pipe through the grate in the yard. Teabag engages with the crossdresser, successfully obtaining the panties Sucre needed to execute the mission. During the night, Sucre navigates the sewerage pipe to reach the break room and successfully fills the hole with cement. However, on his way to the great area, he is apprehended. Despite Sucre's insistence that he wasn't attempting to escape, Belik demands an explanation. This is where the importance of the panties comes into play. When Belik discovers the panties concealed around Sucre's ankle, Sucre claims they belong to his girlfriend. He fabricates a story about hiding under the bleachers after yard time. He says that he was anticipating something coming over the wall. His girlfriend's panties. Thanks to this story, Belik refrains from suspecting Sucre of an escape attempt. However, Sucre is still sent to solitary confinement, joining Lincoln and Michael. The next day, Tweener overhears the group discussing the new carpet installation. He shares this information with Belik prompting Belik to investigate the break room floor under the carpet. Thanks to Sucre's efforts, no hole is found. Fuming at Tweener for the inaccurate information, Belik reassigns him to another cell, where his new cellmate will be Avocado, with intentions similar to teabags. While in solitary, Michael experiences an emotional breakdown, with bleeding fists from repeatedly punching the wall. Concerned for his well-being, Sarah moves him to the psych ward, once Sarah departs, Michael suddenly snaps out of his distressed state, exposing the act as a ruse to talk to Haywire. There's a chance that Haywire still recalls Michael's tattoos, as he once drew them due to his intense fascination. Michael implores Haywire to remember the tattoo on his back, but Haywire responds with a simple who are you, revealing that he doesn't remember anything. In the prison cells, Captain Bellick and CO Geary decide to auction off Michael and Sucre's vacant cell. While inspecting the cell, a potential buyer notices a leaking toilet. Geary assures that it will be fixed within 24 hours. Teabag overhears this conversation and quickly informs the others. If the plumber repairs the toilet seat, he'll discover their secret hole. Seizing the opportunity, C-Note approaches Geary, offering to double the money another buyer is willing to pay. The plan involves collecting funds from C-Note's black associates and friends on the outside. However, with no visiting hours today, they must rely on support from fellow black inmates. When C-Note approaches his friends, they refuse to help due to his association with the PI crew, particularly the white racist inmate Teabag. Enraged, C-Note throws a punch at his friend, triggering a brawl that leaves C-Note injured and empty-handed. Meanwhile, Michael is doing his best to jog Haywire's memory, recounting their encounter in the cell. On the other hand, as a last-ditch effort, Teabag suggests entering the kitchen game to raise enough money to buy the cell. They utilize the money D.B. Cooper gave Michael earlier as investment capital. After a risky card game victory, C-Note hands Geary the agreed-upon price of $500. However, Geary takes the money and informs C-Note that the new price for the cell is $700. With no other choice, C-Note convinces D.B. Cooper to part with his watch. Geary takes the watch and reveals that he has already sold the cell for $700. On the other hand, Michael is still unsuccessful in extracting information from Haywire. When the nurse administers pills to Haywire, Michael takes advantage of the situation. He leads Haywire into a room and induces him to vomit the pills by triggering his gag reflex. Michael does this to prompt Haywire's recollection of earlier thoughts on the pills and the prison layout. There's a chance that Haywire might remember the pathways in the process. Fortunately, Michael's plan succeeds, and Haywire draws the missing pathway. However, along with these memories, Haywire also recalls how Michael framed him to get him kicked out of the cell. As a consequence, Haywire threatens Michael, demanding information about the escape plan, 
or he will expose everything to the officers. In response, Michael discloses the escape details, mentioning that it begins from the basement of the psych ward. Haywire hands over his drawing to Michael. That night, Haywire takes one of the copies he made of the tattoo and escapes from his room. However, the moment he opens the door to the basement, the alarm triggers, leading the on-duty officers to taser him. Once again, Michael has outsmarted him. Later, Pope Henry questions Michael about the burn wound on his back. Michael responds by involving Geary, claiming that the officer extorts money from inmates. It turns out that this is another scheme orchestrated by Sucre and C-Note, conveyed to Michael by Monch. In exchange for being part of the escape plan, Monch burned Geary's uniform while ironing, and D.B. Cooper placed the uniform in Geary's locker. When Pope learns about Geary's involvement in the situation, he checks his locker and discovers the bribe money he just received from C-Note. D.B. Cooper's watch in Geary's scorched uniform. The burnt uniform serves as justification for the presence of a fragment of a guard's uniform in Michael's wound. Consequently, Geary is terminated from his position. Avocado continues to torment Tweener, and there is nothing Tweener can do. Michael approaches him for another favor, like the trick he did with the watch. But Tweener is overwhelmed with emotion. He implores Michael to eliminate Avocado if he expects any more favors. Pouring his heart out, Tweener recounts how he was imprisoned for stealing a baseball card, unaware it was worth $300,000. Despite Tweener's plea, Michael refuses to resort to violence against Avocado. Taking matters into his own hands, Tweener decides to confront Avocado directly. While in their cell, Tweener retrieves a razor blade from under a mattress and carries out a drastic act by castrating Avocado. Michael and Sucre have returned from the psych ward in solitary confinement. Michael briefs the team that the map is complete, and their next move involves entering the infirmary through the pipes beneath the psych ward. However, to access the doctor's office, they require a key for the door. While discussing their plans, they spot a bruzi coming out of the bus. He has re-entered the facility after recovering from the severe wound inflicted by Teabag. However, this isn't the same ruthless Abruzzi. He claims to have found the Lord after a close encounter with death. Fearful that Abruzzi might seek revenge, Teabag approaches his cell with the intention of eliminating him. C-Note intervenes, making it clear to Teabag that Abruzzi is their ticket out of the prison. Later, Abruzzi engages in a religious conversation with Michael and surprisingly forgives Teabag for attempting to murder him. Meanwhile, Michael is concerned that Avocado may retaliate against Tweener for the castration incident. To safeguard Tweener, Michael includes him in the escape plan. Unfortunately, Tweener betrays the team by revealing the details of the escape plan to Bellic. Without wasting any time, Bellic rushes to the break room, pulls up the carpet, and starts smashing the floor, causing the plywood to break. He has finally uncovered the existence of the hole. Before he can exit the room, D.B. Cooper incapacitates him with a shovel, sparking a fierce altercation between the two. Cooper delivers a blow to Bellick's head, rendering him unconscious. Taking advantage of the situation, he gags Bellick, binds his limbs, and leaves him in the sewerage pipe. When Cooper informs the crew about this development, Michael instructs everyone to be prepared as they will execute their plan tonight. As time passes, Officers begin questioning Bellick's whereabouts. Despite suspecting that Tweener might have betrayed them, Michael opts to keep him in the plan, unwilling to lose another inmate to suicide. Meanwhile, Teabag collects leftover broccoli from fellow inmates and sprinkles it on his bed to mask his scent, potentially avoiding detection by dogs during their escape. Abruzzi employs a handful of fertilizer to alter his scent as well. Sarah encounters Michael in the infirmary and asks if he has stolen something from her. Michael confesses that he took the keys to the doctor's office, which was made possible through Nika's private meeting with Sarah. When Sarah asks what he wants, Michael finally discloses his plan to release his brother from prison. In shock, she urges him not to reveal any more details. Michael requests Sarah not to lock the door tonight, explaining that the glass surrounding it has alarm contacts. Sarah remains silent but questions whether his feelings towards her were all part of the plan. Michael admits that his initial flirtation was driven by the plan, but his emotions evolved, and he genuinely wanted to be around her. It pains him that Sarah won't believe him now. Infuriated, Sarah leaves without saying a word. Later, Sarah locates her father at a restaurant and confronts him about the information she provided regarding Lincoln's innocence. He refuses to answer initially, but when Sarah presses him, he admits he saw no need to review Lincoln's file. Sarah is visibly hurt by this revelation, 
Now considering the possibility that Lincoln might be innocent and the government could be actually taking part in his execution, on the other hand, the Taj Mahal model is now completed. As the officers attempt to transfer it to the car, the dome collapses. Pope orders the officers to bring Michael to his office. Michael is summoned and escorted to the office, where he confesses to Pope Henry that he intentionally removed the support from the model. In a tense move, Michael places a knife against Pope's throat and compels him to instruct the officers to transfer Lincoln to the infirmary, keeping him overnight for tests. After Pope does what was instructed, Michael gags Pope, expresses his apologies, and knocks him unconscious. Returning to his cell, Michael finds Sucre already distressed about the upcoming situation. During break time, as the cell doors open, the other crew members approach Michael's cell one by one. They have their jumpsuits now dyed white with hydrogen peroxide. Bellic, still in the crawlspace, manages to remove the tape from his mouth. Swiftly, he loudly screams, attracting the guards' attention. They enter to investigate, but Teabag quickly covers Bellic's mouth with his hand. After reapplying the tape, the crew continues their journey toward the psych ward. Wearing the white jumpsuits, they blend in with the psych ward patients. They unlock the door and enter the psych ward, with Michael donning a blue uniform, posing as an officer. The attendant in the psych ward notices Abruzzi and alerts Michael. To keep him silent, Michael injects the attendant with a sedative. The crew continues their journey from the psych ward to the infirmary through the sewerage pipe. Upon reaching the infirmary, they surround the officer overseeing Lincoln. After rendering the officer unconscious, they proceed to the doctor's office. Thanks to Sarah, the door is not connected to the alarm, allowing Michael and the others easy access. They convert a fire hose into a large rope, connecting one end to the window grate and the other to the elevator. The plan is to tighten the hose tension to rip off the bars. However, the elevator refuses to move on its own. Tweener steps into the elevator and presses the button, causing the grate to be forcefully removed. Everything is going smoothly until Haywire suddenly appears, holding a CO radio in his hands. Michael attempts to keep Haywire calm, but Haywire insists on being part of the escape, or else he'll call the guards. Reluctantly, Haywire becomes a part of the escape plan, while the others start climbing the wire to get to the other side of the wall. D.B. Cooper collapses to the floor. It turns out that when he tried to stop Bellic, he got injured by a piece of glass. As Michael and Sino rush to his aid, Cooper asks Michael to promise to take care of his daughter once he's over the wall. Michael makes the promise. Cooper then discloses where he buried the money but reveals that the government underreported the figure to the media. The actual amount he escaped with was not $1.5 million but $5 million. On the other hand, Pope's secretary calls the officer after being unable to locate him. They soon discover him in a cupboard, gagged and bound to a chair. An alarm is triggered, and all the officers go on high alert. Everyone manages to escape except Munch, as the wire can't bear his weight, breaking and causing him to fall back into the prison. Captured by the officers and questioned about the plan, Munch reveals all the names involved. A-Wing echoes with the sounds of celebrating inmates who are aware that Michael and the PI crew are on the run. Two guards pull Bellic out of the hole, and he promptly requests his shotgun. Bellic emerges to face a gathering of guards surrounding Warden Pope, who issues orders over a bullhorn. As the police officers get into their cars, the eight convicts make their way to the forest. There, they discover a car that C-Note asked his brother-in-law to park. Everyone gets in the car, instructing Haywire to retrieve the keys from a nearby dustbin. While Haywire is occupied, Abruzzi hands Michael the car keys revealing that they sent Haywire away to get rid of him, leaving Haywire behind. The crew continues their journey to the runway. As Lincoln drives the car, Abruzzi attempts to remove Teabag from the group. However, Teabag has already planned ahead. He has attached one side of the handcuffs to his left wrist. Before Abruzzi can pull the trigger, Teabag quickly reaches out and cuffs the other side to Michael's right wrist. Teabag holds the key in his teeth and promptly swallows it before they can retrieve it. Now, the crew is compelled to keep Teabag with them. If they kill him, Michael would have to drag him all the way to the runway. When the car gets stuck in the mud, the crew seeks refuge in a shed. There, Lincoln seizes Teabag, and Sucre attempts to use a cutter to sever the cuffs, but it proves ineffective. Abruzzi resorts to an axe, cutting Teabag's hand and successfully obtaining revenge. The crew then resumes their journey to the runway, but upon arrival, they discover that the plane has already taken off due to the approaching police. The five remaining inmates flee into a field adjacent to the runway, with the police in pursuit. Teabag is sprinting through the forest, clutching his amputated and cut hand. Meanwhile, Tweener, 
who Michael ordered to separate from the crew because he snitched on them, has avoided capture by hiding in the back of a horse trailer. On the other hand, Haywire has stolen a girl's bicycle, and only time will tell where his unpredictable journey will lead him.